Finally, on the 30th of August 1942, Paulus was able to establish a solid and permanent connection with the 14th Panzer Corps, having diverted a good chunk of 51st Army Corps in order to do it. In the end, Wietersheim had survived several days in isolation, surrounded by Soviet divisions, and, although they should have been overwhelmed, the Germans employed their 50 to 60 operational tanks and hundreds of armoured personnel carriers far more skillfully and in closer coordination with supporting artillery, anti-tank guns and infantry. As it was, given the poor employment of its armoured forces, poor command and control and coordination, a near absence of routine communications, weak artillery and air support, and, at best, tenuous logistical support, Yeremenka's counterstrokes were condemned to failure. Most of Yeremenka's units were now depleted and disorganised. But what I'd like to point out is that it had taken at least three days for Paulus to march a few miles and link up with Wietersheim's corps. And this was in the middle of summer, when the Germans had the initiative and when the Soviets were pretty weak overall. Plus, even though Wietersheim had received supplies from the air, thanks to the Luftwaffe, and from the ground, thanks to the efforts of Kampfgruppe Kegler, his corps had almost run out of ammunition, and Wiedersheim and Huber had been on the verge of issuing a breakout. It was Paulus and Hitler who had told them to stand fast, refusing to issue a breakout order. And yet, no historian complains about this. Nobody says, by the way, Riedersheim was right to consider breaking out of his pockets. Hopefully, many of you can see the parallels with what happened to Paulus' 6th Army in the future. It's hard to know if this event had a direct influence on what happened later, but either way, the lessons of this encirclement were not learnt, and Paulus was not happy with the way Wietersheim had conducted himself during his encirclement. Wietersheim had doubts about success. Such an attitude seemed unbearable to Paulus, who was of the opinion that the two attacking armies should still take the city. Paulus regarded any general who doubted in final success as unsuited to command in this serious situation. This standard also seems to have applied to himself. So yes, you cannot even consider the idea of failure in the Wehrmacht, let alone retreat. And since Paulus had been proven correct, and had linked up with Wiedersheim's corps, Perhaps we can understand, since he was later ordered to stand fast, why Paulus himself didn't issue a breakout order. Food for thought. To the south, under the clear morning sky, the panzers of Kampfgruppe Lanken sped northeast for an entire hour, meeting no resistance along the way. They reached Hill 130 with no problems, but as they went beyond it, they were engaged by Soviet troops and tanks and had to call in Stuka's support. Kampfgruppe Broich was unable to come up in support, as Broich was engaged with enemy tanks at Hill 150. Worse, retreating Soviet units were moving north towards them, tying down elements of the division. Further west, several units, including the 66th Naval Rifle Brigade and the 157th Rifle Division, fell back behind the Yerik River, as Shumilov's previous orders to retreat had filtered down the lines. Units from both the 62nd and 64th Armies were now trying to avoid encirclement, with both Chuikov and Golikov witnessing this withdrawal. In the Novi Rogachik area, we saw some units of the 62nd Army retreating, while fighting was already taking place in the Karpovka area. The 64th Army's units were some 18 to 30 miles from this position, and I was very worried whether they would be able to withdraw to their new line of defence in good time. This is interesting because, instead of pummeling the retreating Soviet units or trying to interdict and delay their retreat, Richthofen decided to shift his focus. Following his new orders, his bombers flew off to bomb the city of Stalingrad. Yes, some bombers did assist the ground troops, 
But Richthofen's priorities seemed to be concentrated on terrorizing the civilians of Stalingrad, and then complaining that the ground troops were not moving fast enough. Of course, 8th Air Army was basically dead in the air. The few planes that they actually had left couldn't get through the German fighter screens, and were unable to stop the bombers striking the city. Those pilots that had survived until this point were sent up over and over in a desperate attempt to keep the enemy at bay. The persistent air combat missions exhausted us to the point where we almost couldn't even eat. We only drank water or ate watermelons. The heat parched our lips. Between the missions we sat with our commander, Martyov, and only exchanged brief words. We suffered considerable losses. In a matter of days, Komlev, Viktovsky, and Lugovets were shot down. Young pilots perished. They didn't even last long enough to get any combat experience. The situation was too difficult. And they weren't the only ones in trouble. Unlike the other units, Colonel Smirnov still hadn't got the message to withdraw, and continued to hold his line, or at least attempted to do so, as his brigade was shredded by the Axis advance. The survivors were now surrounded and bypassed, with Colonel Smirnov himself being wounded. Broich's panzer grenadiers had cleared the Soviets from Hill 150 by mid-morning, capturing a thousand prisoners in the process. Broich was then able to catch up with Camp Gumilankin slightly later. And together, they reached the Shevlenaya River, where Broich's men forged a crossing, followed by Camp Gubilankin. As this was happening, Camp Group Edelsheim beat back several Soviet attacks on the division's west flank and launched a counterattack against them, taking around 1,500 prisoners in the process. Unfortunately, Soviet mines, the bottleneck caused by the fact that they'd only captured one bridge across the river, and the pressure from the flank prevented 24th Panzer Division from advancing any further. Soviet infantry attacks went in against the bridgehead itself, and 88mm flat guns had to be brought up to hold back an attack by 12 T-34s, and even more Soviet tanks that were roaming nearby. Meanwhile, the remnants of the 154th Naval Rifle Brigade, now commanded by their artillery commander, Captain Swearword, slipped back through the German lines that evening. Falk continues the story. After receiving a report from Captain F, an angry General Shumilov demoted the injured Colonel Shmernov to Lieutenant, and put Captain YouTube censorship in his place as temporary commander of the brigade. However brave the actions of the 154th Naval Rifle Brigade were, its determined stand was not worth the loss of some 80% of its strength in a single day. It seems unfair for Shumilov to pick on Smirnov, because the colonel hadn't actually received the order to withdraw. The blame should really fall on the lack of radios and proper communications equipment in the Red Army. But yes, it's clear that the policy of not one step back only actually applies if a unit was given the order to hold its ground. In the event that a unit was ordered to withdraw, then deciding to hold your ground because of not one step back was a bad idea, and you would be punished for not taking a step back. So really, the actual policy of not one step back was obey your orders, even if you didn't receive them, as in this case. However, it wasn't just the Soviet generals who were having command and communication issues. To the higher-ups in the German command, Hot's breakthrough looked promising. It seemed to them that there was a chance for a fresh encirclement, which was why von Weichs, Army Group B's commander, now gave this order to Paulus. Despite the extremely tense defensive situation at 14th Panzer Corps, you are to concentrate the strongest forces possible from 51st Corps and 14th Panzer Corps from the area of Konaya and West, and to attack in a generally southerly direction as soon as the push of 4th Panzer Army begins to be indirectly effective, in order, in cooperation with 4th Panzer Army, to annihilate the enemy forces west of Stalingrad. This order, though, is complete and utter fantasy. It had taken Paulus all of his available strength just to link up with Vitasheim, and he had nothing spare at this moment to strike southeast towards Hot. 
Now, yes, Paulus would start to gather troops for a future strike towards Stalingrad, as we will see shortly. But at this moment, he was fully committed. This order from von Weichs is totally unrealistic and out of touch with the reality on the ground. So, was it a communication issue, or was he overburdened and overstretched, dealing with multiple armies under his command, or was it a combination of the two? Either way, Hot was not going to get much help from Paulus at this moment, and the likelihood of an encirclement of Soviet forces was rapidly fading away, as were the hopes and dreams of the German high command. Foul Blau was failing. And this seems to have confirmed to Hitler that his generals had failed him once again. Halder notes in his diary, Today's conferences with Führer were again the occasion of abusive reproaches against the military leadership abilities of the highest commands. He charges them with intellectual conceit, mental non-adaptability and utter failure to grasp essentials. Perhaps he was right. Hauptmann Steinhoff, the same pilot who had crash-landed in the 16th Panzer Division's area a couple of days before, took off into the air once again. He engaged eight Soviet fighters escorting eight Soviet bombers and managed to shoot down one of the fighters. This was his 100th air kill. And he managed to return to his base that morning without having to crash-land his plane this time. Then, his unit was transferred to the Crimea and the Caucasus, retiring him out of the Stalingrad campaign. But while Steinhoff had got out of the maelstrom, the fighting continued for everyone else. Kovalenka tried once again to break through the German corridor, this time with the 39th Guards Rifle Division, transferred from the 4th Tank Army, and the 315th Rifle Division. With this support, the 164th Tank Brigade managed to take part of Kuzmichi in the morning, but a German counterattack quickly pushed them back. And because it's the final day of August, it's time to take a look at the strategic picture once more. In Hitler's eyes, so far, Operation Blau had been largely successful. They had reached the outskirts of Stalingrad, and the oil centre of Mayakop was in their hands. But not all of the summer offensive's objectives had been taken, and now the armies were getting bogged down as autumn was approaching. Despite having destroyed one Soviet army, battered three more, and inflicted 300,000 casualties and 1,000 tank losses on the Red Army, Hot and Palace's armies had not yet taken Stalingrad itself, and were miles away from Astrakhan. Worse, Wittesheim's 14th Panzer Corps was now fighting for its survival, with just 125 tanks remaining. This number was simply too little to take Stalingrad with. That is, of course, unless the enemy just magically disappeared. Suddenly, on the 31st of August, the Russian attackers surprisingly gave up the attempt to destroy the 14th Panzer Corps and withdrew to Stalingrad. There's so much wrong with this sentence, it's a mystery how it was conceived of in the first place. Hapt basically jumps from this date to the 10th of September, as does Karl Strecker in his book. So, of course, if you skip about 10 days of battle, then yes, it would appear as though the Red Army just fell back all of a sudden. But in reality, the Soviets were not giving up their attempt to destroy Wiedersheim's corps. They were, in fact, building up for another attack. And the only Soviet units retreating were in the south, or from the Kalach area. The 66th Naval Rifle Brigade, the 118th Fortified Region, and the 157th Rifle Division of 64th Army fell back overnight to the bend at the seam between the Karpovka and Shevelinaya rivers, joined by other units of 62nd Army. The remnants of the 204th and 138th Rifle Divisions also withdrew behind the lines and into 64th Army's reserve. And it was clear that, after a huge delay, Hot's 4th Panzer Army finally had 64th Army on the run. At 0600 hours, Kempf's units lashed out from the Chevalenaya bridgehead. Fremery and Heim crossed the river to secure their foothold on the eastern bank. 
Unfortunately, as they did so, 129th Panzer Battalion's commander, Bon Vetch, who had only taken command 23 days before, was struck by a bullet and was put out of action, being replaced by Oberleutnant Petsch. So this wasn't an easy crossing. Worse, Petsch was only 23 years old and was not really suitable to lead a battalion of panzers, even if the battalion had been reduced to the size of a company by this point due to all the losses. Difficulties in the crossing aside, the advance continued. 24th Panzer Division attempted to move north, but was blocked by Soviet tank units and by the 56th Tank Brigade, which was striking in from the east. While most of 56th Tank Brigade consisted of T-34s and T-70s, it had some M3 medium tanks as well, armed with 75mm guns. These guns outranged the 50mm cannons on the Panzer III tanks, the main tank the Germans had, which was why the enemy tanks were not advancing but were standing at great distances and shooting at the German Panzers, which simply did not have a tank cannon powerful enough to reply. The impasse continued for hours. Deciding that the Panzers could not effectively take out the Soviet tanks alone, 88mm guns and Stukas were brought in to hammer them, allowing 24th Panzer Division to drive northwest along the bank of the Shevlenaya River. This move pierced the Soviet lines and gave Hauenschelt an opportunity to thrust even further north. So, with 29th Motorized Division racing to catch up, Broich broke through the remaining Soviet positions, including some concrete bunkers with tank turrets fitted on them, and dashed to the railway line east of Basagino Station. As they gathered about their new positions, a Soviet armoured train came along the tracks towards them from the west. Pioneers quickly blew up the track ahead of the train, causing it to derail, and an 88mm flak gun put the steel beast out of its misery. 24th Panzer Division then proceeded to secure its gains. It had lost about 10 Panzers this day, and was down to 41 operational Panzers now. Although not all of these were write-offs, as Kempf himself makes clear. I have ascertained that in the last few days, many combat vehicles, panzers, self-propelled guns, etc., have left the battlefield because they have either suffered some negligible damage, failure of radio equipment, loss of running wheel, or have brought back wounded men. So long as the combat vehicles are mobile and battle-worthy with their weapons, they will remain on the battlefield until the conclusion of the fighting. It is an absurdity that intact combat vehicles bring back wounded men. In addition, Kempf also made it clear that The leading spearheads of our attacking troops must know that it is wrong to shoot with tracer ammunition into grain and haystacks, as well as undefended small cottages, and set these on fire. All grain, etc., is urgently required by our troops for the nourishment of man and animal. All destroyed grain damages the supply situation of the German Reich. It is just as senseless to kill horses and other useful livestock, cattle, sheep, etc., because all of these animals are also urgently required for draft and nourishment purposes. An instruction about this will also be given by unit commanders. Clearly, if Kempf was issuing this instruction, then the troops of 48th Panzer Corps were routinely burning down undefended cottages, haystacks and grain stacks as they rampaged across the steppe. And Kemp's objection to this wasn't to stop burning the cottages and food because of the poor civilians, he wanted them to stop because the food they contained was needed for the German troops and horses and the Third Reich. Yes, not only was there no sympathy for the future slaves of the Reich, but the 4th Panzer Army and the Wehrmacht as a whole wasn't exactly behaving itself as some have claimed it was. In addition to the problems in the Stalingrad area, the Soviets were beginning to make things more difficult for Hot to the east. The Stavka now ordered Lieutenant General Gerasimenko to prevent the enemy from reaching Astrakhan by reorganizing his Stalingrad military district into a new army, the 28th Army which he begins to do on this day. Although it wouldn't be fully converted for a few more days, 
This would prevent Hoth's Mobile Reserve, the 16th Motorized Division, from moving further east, and would force it to be committed to the southern defence rather than against any meaningful target like Stalingrad. It has also been argued that if 51st Army Corps had now advanced to the Kopovka River and captured the railway beyond it at a place called Novi Rogschik, it could have met up with 24th Panzer Division. This could have encircled the 131st and 112th Rifle Divisions of 62nd Army and the 157th Rifle Division, the 20th Motorized Rifle and 66th Naval Rifle Brigades, and the two school regiments of 64th Army. If these forces were destroyed, and if 51st Corps continued its eastward march, it was likely the Corps would have sufficient forces to penetrate into Stalingrad from the west. At this juncture, however, decisive action by Shumilov and a faulty decision by Paulus combined to forestall further Soviet disaster. Glantz isn't the only one to champion this view. Inexplicably, Paulus did not move. Harried by the suicidal Russian attempts to break his thin corridor to the Volga, he refused to rush troops south for a link-up. Crucial hours passed, another urgent cable went out to Paulus, again he failed to respond. While there was the potential for an encirclement, this view isn't correct for a few reasons. First, Shumilov had already ordered his units to retreat, and by this point they were crossing over the Shevelinaya River, which is where Novi Rogschik is. But Glantz thinks this only happened after the 1st of September, and that these forces were further south than they actually were. Even Churikov said on the 30th that there were retreating units from the 64th Army in the Novi Rogschik area. So, realistically, because these units were practically out of the area of encirclement anyway, the likelihood of an encirclement was low, even if it had been attempted. Secondly, because Wiedersheim's corps needed rescuing, Paulus had little choice but to shift forces away from this axis of advance and move them to reinforce Kampfgruppe Kegler's relief efforts. He did this days before, leaving token forces in this area by the 31st of August. In fact, on this day, the 71st Infantry Division was reinforced by a Luftwaffe Field Regiment, probably from General Wolfgang Pickert's 9th Flak Division, which was attached to Palace's 6th Army at this time. These Luftwaffe troops had little infantry training, and, under instructions of Hermann Goering, were only allowed to be employed on defensive missions on quiet fronts. So there was no chance of these guys attempting to link up with the 24th Panzer Division. And third, the opportunity to encircle the southern portions of 62nd and 64th armies passed days before, when Paulus made the decision to strike to the Volga north of Stalingrad. We've already discussed that in a previous episode, so we won't repeat that argument here. However, the decision to shift forces to the north wasn't necessarily Paulus's fault. If Hart had managed to break through earlier, Paulus could have reacted differently. But Hart had consistently failed to break through 64th Army's defences. So how was Paulus to know that this time would be different? And that's not to say that Paulus didn't make mistakes, he did, but this particular one can't really be blamed on him. And what's interesting is that Paulus was positively reacting to events. A few days before, Paulus had decided to withdraw from 8th Army Corps' bridgehead. So, on the 31st of August 1942, the 389th Infantry Division willingly abandoned its positions and fell back from the front line. A regiment from the 305th Infantry Division took over its place on the Don, and Yenika's division then moved south to the Akimovsky area to rest and refit. This would be an important move because 389th Infantry Division would, in the coming days, be part of 6th Army's first assault on the city of Stalingrad itself, and this withdrawal allowed it to partake in that attack. Plus, the 245th Sturmgeschütz Battalion was assigned to 51st Army Corps, again in preparation for the assault on Stalingrad. 
What's important to note though is that Paulus had made a mistake here. Just not the mistake that Glantz and Craig were concerned with. Paulus had used the 389th and 384th Infantry Divisions to forge a crossing of the Don, which they subsequently didn't use, and then decided to abandon a chunk of it in the end anyway. This tied down two divisions that could have been better used elsewhere, at a time when Vitus Himes and Seidlitz's forces were crying out for reinforcements. The seizure and retention of this bridgehead cost us heavy losses, although it enabled us to carry out the task assigned by the Führer. The 8th Corps held down major enemy forces and inflicted heavy losses on him, enabling the army to accomplish the forcing of the Don along both sides of Verziaci and to rapidly break through to the Volga. But Isayev thinks otherwise. A major group of German forces had been tied down in fighting and suffered heavy losses. Yes, the bridgehead tied down several Soviet divisions, but the question is, who needed reserves more at that moment in order to throw them onto the scales of battle? They could have just tied down those same Soviet formations along the corridor to the Volga, which would have served the same purpose but it would also have helped the overall situation that the 6th Army was facing with regards to Wiedersheim's trapped corps. Having just one extra division in that area would have secured the route to Wiedersheim's corps, allowed additional supplies to roll in, and wouldn't have stretched the German divisions as much as they were, allowing them to deal more effectively with the Soviet counterattacks. It also would have freed up units of 51st Army Corps to head southeast and potentially link up with Hot's 4th Panzer Army, trapping Soviet units in the south. So, having two divisions tied up fighting in a bridgehead that they didn't really need doesn't really make any sense, and Paulus, and maybe Hitler, since he seems to have ordered them to hold onto the bridgehead, are to blame for this. An operational blunder that certainly contributed to the German defeat at Stalingrad. But regardless of Paulus's mistake with 8th Army Corps' bridgehead, it was obvious that Paulus was in no position to strike southeast on the 31st of August. Yet, von Weichs was determined that he did. Weichs ordered Paulus and Hot to now link up east of Potomnik, trapping Soviet forces in a pocket to the west, which would then be subsequently destroyed. Now, to be fair, Vikes does say that this new attack should begin in two days' time, on the 2nd of September, giving both armies time to prepare. But again, Paulus was currently in no position to fulfil this request, Hot wasn't in a great position either, hence the delay, and there was a clear danger that Soviet forces retreating from the west were going to slip the noose of the encirclement. So again, how realistic was Vikes being? Was there communication issues, and was he overstretched at this time? Either way, he didn't have a firm grasp of what was going on at Stalingrad. The Soviet aviation at Stalingrad was in rags, as were the combat spirits among many of its surviving airmen. In fact, 8th Air Army only had 57 fighters and 32 Sturmoviks left, which was basically nothing. Luckily though, it started raining on the 1st of September 1942, which grounded a lot of the Luftwaffe aircraft and prevented them from bombing Soviet troops on the ground. By this point, 64th Army's 66th Naval Rifle Brigade and the 157th Rifle Division had crossed over the Shevlinaya River and were now fighting almost in encirclement against 24th Panzer Division. There was still a potential, if Hot's forces moved north, to fully encircle the westernmost units of 62nd and 64th Armies. But looking at the map, it was clear that a northern thrust couldn't happen until the eastern flank of 48th Panzer Corps was secure. So Kempf decided to shift both the 14th Panzer and the 29th Motorized Divisions to the west behind 24th Panzer Division's advance. The 29th Motorized Division struck east at 0800 hours and took a nearby hill, but were stopped by heavy fire coming from another hill, and they had to wait for the 14th Panzer Division to take it. 
Soviet tanks fought stubbornly, but couldn't stop Heim's men from taking the hill later in the day. And with the fighting to the south going on, 24th Panzer Division couldn't really advance either. But the delay allowed the division to consolidate its newly gained positions, hampered slightly by cold wind and rain in the afternoon. They did take some ground, but had to wait until the other units caught up. Still, despite not going anywhere, 48th Panzer Corps had taken 3,200 prisoners on this day. And what's interesting is that, while 24th Panzer Division's panzer strength had fallen to just 31 tanks in the last few days, it had repaired and replenished some of these on the 1st of September, and now stood at 56 tanks. That was more than it had started with at the beginning of the latest attack. However, its manpower strength was falling, having just 1,266 men in the Panzer Regiment, 1,274 in the 21st Panzer Regiment, and 1,575 men in the 26th Grenadier Regiment. And it wasn't the only unit that was suffering. On 1st of September, the infantry strength of 3rd Motorized Division was 2,412 men, but its defensive line was 20 kilometers long, giving a density of around 120 men per kilometer of front. Clearly, Palace and Hot's forces were depleted and were badly in need of reinforcements. However, it's worth remembering that the Soviet units were also suffering. By this point, 64th Army's 138th, 126th, 29th and 38th Rifle Divisions only numbered around 500 to 1,000 men each. Yes, they could barely be called battalions, let alone divisions. According to Falk, the 126th Rifle Division had lost 10,336 men killed or missing throughout August. That's not even counting the men who were wounded. This is just killed and missing. Well, a Soviet rifle division at this stage of the war only had 10,386 men. So basically, this unit was wiped out. Whatever was left of it was a mere shell of what it had once been, and it couldn't even call itself a company at this point. There's no way it could be classed as a division. Kempf and Hot were now concerned by the gap that had formed between the 14th and 24th Panzer Divisions, and the inability of the 14th Panzer Division to defeat the enemy it faced. Worse, 24th Panzer Division had failed to link up with the 6th Army, which would prevent them from destroying Soviet forces who were fleeing from the west. Yeremenka reacted to this potential encirclement at 20.00 hours by ordering the 62nd and 64th Armies to withdraw into parts of the Stalingrad S defensive lines as soon as possible. Notably, Yeremenka didn't want to defend the S line around Potomnik, instead ordering them to fall back to the east of that, but still hold the line from Gumrak to the north. Paulus, on the other hand, didn't act, which has brought some more criticism against him. Von Weichs sent repeated messages to Paulus calling for him to attack south. But look at the situation. Paulus has nothing to attack with. In fact, his main attacking force, 14th Panzer Corps, wasn't in any position to attack south. The 3rd Motorized Division alone faced somewhere in the region of 5 rifle divisions, 4 tank brigades, and parts of 4 more rifle divisions and parts of 2 more rifle brigades. A total of around 200 Soviet tanks. Paulus only had one division in reserve, the 389th Infantry Division, which had only just been pulled out of the line after having sustained heavy casualties crossing the Don. It wasn't viable to send this division southeast at this time. And even if this division had gone south, they were marching on foot and probably wouldn't have got there in time anyway. The only other division that could assist in this southeastern attack was the 71st Infantry Division, 
which was stretched thin to the point that it had been reinforced by a Luftwaffe field regiment, and had most of its units in the northern part of the line because of the pressure against 14th Panzer Corps. So it's alright saying attack southeast, but it was practically impossible, and calling powerless cautious at this stage is unjustified. The only way that these two armies would meet was if Hot's 4th Panzer Army came north to the 6th Army, which they had already failed to do. However, they were doing their best. With Hot's blessing, Kempf issued orders for the 24th Panzer Division to thrust north the next day to reach 6th Army's units, promising that the 20th Romanian Division would cover their western flank. Even though there was next to nothing on the western flank anyway at this point, but Fair enough. Speaking of the West, much further in that direction, at Serafimovich, the Germans and Italians launched a joint attack against the Soviet bridgehead. Messer had been reinforced with Alpini Mountain Infantry and some obsolete L6-40 light tanks. These were basically useless. Limited armour protection, no cross-country capability, and a two-man crew. A two-man crew! The Italians actually preferred to use their armoured cars for reconnaissance rather than these hunks of junk. And that was the only role that these tanks were now capable of performing. Which was why they were in the reconnaissance battalion of the 3rd Chalere Division. Compounding these issues, it appears that the Italians did the same thing that the Soviets were used to doing. Sending their tanks ahead of their infantry, causing them to be separated, isolated and defeated. While the German 22nd Panzer Division did push the 14th Guards Rifle Division back slightly, the Alpini didn't do anything of note, and the Italians decided to blame the Germans for their own failure. To be fair to the Italians, the Alpini had only just arrived, having marched over 300 kilometers, in some cases 700, and were committed piecemeal into the fighting, with some of their units still hundreds of kilometers away. And their supporting L6-40 tanks weren't exactly useful. But still, it's clear that this attack had failed, and the Soviets still posed a significant threat to the Axis Don flank, which doesn't bode well for the future. With the exception of Hot's attack, Axis forces were barely moving. It was now down to Hot to get the attack on Stalingrad rolling again. If he could reach Paulus's forces and shorten the line, there was a chance that they could still mount a joint attack on the city of Stalingrad. The question is, would they be able to do that before the Soviets launched their own counterattacks? We'll find out soon. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.